Michigan's Fat Five recruiting class is probably the greatest recruiting class of all time and also the most successful team to be led by underclassmen. Because typically in college basketball, the team with the most experience is the team that's going to find the most success. This recruiting class was led by big names Chris Weber and Jalen Rose, who were both Michigan Nails and received most of the spotlight. But as with any group, there's always that one member who is just as important, who isn't getting the same recognition. Enter Jawan Howard, the George Harrison of the Fab Five. A tall, well-mannered guy from loading homes on the south side of Chicago and the NBA's first $100 million man. So let's get into his story. This is what happened to Jawan Howard. Drop the intro. Jawan Howard was born February 7, 1973 to parents Elena Watson and Leroy Watson III. His mother, Helena, was only a junior in high school when she had Jawan, and his father was fresh out of serving in the U.S. Army, so neither was really ready for the responsibility of raising a child, and Jawan actually slept on a pillow inside a dresser drawer for the first week of his life because his parents didn't have enough money for a crib. And eventually his father left the family, which means it was just Jawan and his mother, who was only 17, and really wasn't ready to be the mother that Jawan needed because she was young and still wanted to live her life. So the responsibility of raising Jawan eventually fell on his maternal grandmother, Jenny May. And honestly, Jawan couldn't have asked for a better situation because Jenny May is the type of mother that I feel every young man needs, especially growing up in the environment that Jawan grew up in. Because Jawan grew up in the Lauren Homes projects on the south side of Chicago, an area known for drugs and gang violence with the two most prominent gangs being the GDs and Black P-Stones. Thankfully, Jawan didn't have to worry about affiliating with any gangs as Jenny May wasn't going for it, constantly chasing away gangs, looking to recruit a young Jawan Howard. Jawan was brought up with rules and was taught to be respectful, show manners, and always be presentable. Jenny May made sure he always did his homework, kept his room clean, and was well-groomed, as well as saying yes ma'am and no ma'am something that I'm too familiar with because I was raised the same way. Jawan had fallen in love with basketball at a very young age and is one of the more well-known hoopers in the Chicago area. As he and his friends built a name for themselves hooping at Abbott and Chestnut Park, entering high school, Jawan attended Chicago Vocational Career Academy, a school with a gym that had no AC, heat, or locker rooms, and actually required its players to get dressed and prepared for games in a history class, but at least they had Jawan. And as soon as he arrived to the school as a sophomore, he was already held as a blue chip prospect for the 1991 recruiting class. As a sophomore, he led the school to a 23-7 record, as well as dropping 26 in a loss against Simeon, who was led by Dean Thomas, who was named Illinois' Mr. Basketball. In the summer after his sophomore year, he really made a name for himself with his showings in the Nike Academic Betterment and Career Development Camp, where he matched up against another highly regarded recruit in Sean Bradley and performed extremely well, catching the attention of many. He further cemented his status as one of the best basketball recruits with his performance at the Bill Conner camp, where many scouts had him listed as a top 10 underclassman after he showed out. Hitting into his junior year, many people had regarded him as the best player in Illinois. He had an up and down junior year and finished the season with a mediocre performance in a loss against King High School and the Chicago Public School League semifinals. The team finished the season with a 24-7 record. He was named second team All-State and was also an honor student. Jawan was invited back to the Nike All-American camp. Jawan was evaluated as the best senior basketball player at the camp, above names such as Chris Weber, Cherokee Parks, Glenn Robertson, and Allen Henderson. He also won MVP at the Boston Shootout and started getting buzzed as the best prospect in the nation. Recruiters from colleges all around the world were trying to get this kid to sign with the school. It got to the point that Jawan had to issue a statement letting colleges know to contact his coach and not call his home because he didn't want his grandma and aunt to be upset with all the calls throughout the day, and when he is making his decision, he's going to take those who respected his wishes into consideration. Heading into his senior year, Jawan was ready to make a decision on what college to attend. At this time, he was thinking about staying home and attending Illinois, but he also thought about Arizona State and Michigan. And as the days got closer to the start of the senior season, he basically made the decision that he was going to attend Michigan. Being the first player in their freshman class to commit to the school, and a lot of credit goes to Brian Dutcher for getting him to commit because he understood the relationship between Jawan and Jenny May. 
and use that to help build a better relationship with Jawan, something Arizona State's Lou Olsen failed to do because he didn't make the connection. And on November 2nd, he let it be known he will be signing with the Wolverines. This should have been one of the happier days of Jawan's life. He was finally taking the next step towards his dream of being a professional basketball player, but unfortunately, his day ended in tragedy and became one of the worst days in Jawan's life. As only a few hours after announcing his decision, his grandma Janie may have passed away due to a heart attack. Jawan Howard was hurting bad. He lost the most important family he had and the person who groomed him into being a fine young man. The woman who kept him safe and away from all the bullshit, the person who loved him more than anything in the world, was gone. Just like that. It's a pain that you can't understand unless you've been through it. And it's a pain I wouldn't wish on anyone. After losing his grandma, he decided to move out of the home even though his aunt still lived there. He probably just couldn't deal with the pain of coming to that house every day knowing that his grandma wouldn't be there to ask him about his day or to make him dinner or just anything. It just wouldn't feel like home anymore. And that's understandable. He moved in with his high school coach, Richard Cook, to finish out his senior year. He averaged 27 points, eight rebounds, and three assists his senior year. Yet again, he took his team to the semifinals, but lost again. He was named a McDonald's All-American, made the All-State team, was named first team All-American by Parade Magazine, and earned the Gatorade Circle of Champions Illinois Player of the Year award, as well as helped recruit Jimmy King to commit to Michigan, which helped solidify Michigan's recruiting class, as they also recruited Jalen Rose, Chris Webber, and Ray Jackson. These five freshmen will be dubbed the Fab Five, but more on that in a bit. Now, outside of Howard's athletic accomplishments, Howard was quite the student as well. He was the president of his high school student council, made honor roll, was named the prom king, and was only one of eight of the top 25 public school league players to get an ACT score high enough to be eligible to play as a freshman in college. As a freshman, Jawan Howard did something that wasn't too common at the time, and he started in 31 of the 34 games for Michigan. He was third in scoring and second in rebounds for the team with averages of 11 points, six rebounds, and two assists a night for the most popular team in college basketball. Because it was a team led by five freshman recruits, as all five of them started by the halfway point of the season, Michigan finished that season 25 and nine, was ranked the 15th team in the nation, and was given the number six seed in the Southeast Division for the NCAA tournament. They won their first five games, making it to the championship game, but was destroyed by a Duke team that featured college basketball legend Chris Lehner, as well as Grant Hill. Michigan would run it back the next year with the same court as all five members of the Fab Five returned. Jawan averaged 15.7 rebounds and two assists for his sophomore campaign. Michigan improved to a record of 31 and five and was ranked as the third team in the nation and was given the number one seed in the West for the NCAA tournament. Yet again, Michigan made it all the way to the championship game, but yet again lost his time to North Carolina. After Michigan received a technical foul because Chris Webber called a timeout when Michigan had none. After the season, Webber ended up being the first of the Fab Five to leave for the NBA, which gave Howard an opportunity to really step up for the team, and he did, actually becoming the leading scorer and rebounder for a good Michigan team. He averaged 21 points, nine rebounds, and two assists a game, and made the Associated Press third team college All-American. Michigan finished with a record of 24 and eight and was ranked the 11th team in the nation and was given the number three seed in the Midwest for the NCAA tournament. They made it to the regional final, but lost to the number one seed at Arkansas. After the season, Jawan Howard decided to lead the team and declare for the NBA draft, along with fellow teammate Jalen Rose. Jawan would be selected with the fifth pick in the first round to the Washington Bullets. Now, Jawan's career didn't get off to the best start, as the Washington Bullets were not all that convinced that Howard was their guy, which is crazy to think because they just selected him with the fifth pick, and if you're not certain of the player you're selecting with the fifth pick, why select them in the first place? And you can say Howard felt the same way, as he didn't like how low the Bulls had valued him, and things had gotten bitter at times during contract negotiation for his rookie contract, because the NBA used to let rookies negotiate the rookie contracts back in the 90s. Things had gotten so bad during negotiations that at one point, Jawan had broken down in tears during a negotiating session at Bulls owner A. Poland's house, but eventually the parties came to terms on an 11-year, $36.6 million contract. Shortly after the Bulls received Jawan's former Michigan teammate, Chris Webber, right before the start of Jawan's rookie season. Jawan performed above expectation in his rookie campaign, starting in 52 of the 65 games, and was the team's second leading scorer and rebounder, averaging 17 points, eight rebounds, and three assists, 
which earned him second team all rookie. He also finished getting his college degree that season, a promise he had made to his grandma before she had passed away. The Bulls finished with a record of 21 and 61, and going to his second year, Howard viewed it a lot differently after performing so well in his rookie campaign. And his second year further proved the point that he was legit, as he went on to have the best season of his career, averaging 22 points, eight rebounds, and four assists a night, improving the Bulls record to a record of 39 and 43, even though they had lost Chris Webber early in the season to injury. Jerron's career year earned him an all-star appearance as well as third team All-NBA. Jawan's reputation as a leader and a fine individual grew along with his game that season. Coaches around the league regarded him as one of the best young players in the NBA and he even garnered comparisons to Celtic legend Kevin McHale. Also, at a time when the league's young players were being categorized as either selfish, egotistical, troublemakers, or good guys, Howard's name always made the latter's list and was even quoted saying, I don't want to be one of those young guys who take the money and don't care about anything else. It bugs me when you read the paper and some of the NBA veterans are saying, these young guys, they're messing up the league. Well, I'm one of those young guys and I don't only care about the money. I love the game of basketball. That quote was a little ironic, but I'll get into that a little later. At this point, Juwan was really popular in the DC area as well as Chicago, not only because of excellent play on the court, but because of the charitable work he's done in the community as well as being a positive role model and influence. He donated tens of thousands of dollars as well as help build a 2,500 square foot playground along with the regulation sized basketball court for his hometown neighborhood. That offseason, Jawan Howard was also in contract negotiations after opting out of his contract with the Washington Bullets. He signed a seven year, $100.8 million deal with the Miami Heat on July 15, but the NBA ended up voiding the contract because the Heat should have been over the cap after almost losing Jawan. The Bullets made some moves cleared up some money and signed Jawan Howard to the same contract, seven years, $100.8 million, officially making him the first NBA player to get a $100 million contract. After signing the contract, Jawan Howard found himself in a legal battle with a Detroit woman who filed a paternity suit against him. He also was dealing with some other things and found himself in a state of depression. The worst of it happened to him at the beginning of his third season where he was pulled over and arrested for a DWI after leaving a private party. He failed both the field sobriety test and breathalyzer test. He was booked and released on his own reconnaissance and had a court date scheduled for the following month. This event along with a couple of others start to damage his once great reputation. Now people make mistakes and Jawan owned up to them and took accountability for his actions. But just like anything, people like to let the bad outweigh the good and that's just how it goes. Also Jawan's numbers experienced a decline in his third season as he averaged 19 points, eight rebounds, and four assists per game. But the Bullets did improve as a team, as Chris Webber was back from injury and played most of the season, as well as they acquired point guard Rod Strickland and their Sheed Wallace trade. The Bullets ended up finishing the season 44 and 38 and making the playoffs for the first time in eight years, where they matched up against Jawan Howard's hometown team, the Chicago Bulls, in the first round where the Bulls swept them, which must have been bittersweet for Jawan since his friends and family were watching his playoff debut. Jawan averaged 19 points, six rebounds, and two assists for the series. After his third year, Howard's career was kind of stagnated. He slightly declined again in his fourth year and even had to deal with a sexual assault case that was later dismissed. He also won the silver suit that later followed. In his fifth year, he had a little bit of a bounce back year, but nothing like his second year. And by the time his sixth year came around, he was only averaging 15 points, six rebounds, and three assists. He was no longer the player he was when he signed that $100 million contract. Injuries had taken away part of his game. And after the season, he will only appear in 54 more games for Washington in the following season before being traded to the Dallas Mavericks in 2001. He will play in Dallas for one year, putting up decent numbers around 15 points, seven rebounds before being traded to Denver. In Denver, he put up about 18 points and five rebounds before leaving the team after a year and a half. He signed a contract with the Orlando Magic for the 2003 and 4 season and was traded to the Houston Rockets after just one season in Orlando. In Houston, he experienced his sharpest decline as he averaged around 10 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 assists per game and was basically just a role player at this point in his career. He spent 3 years in Houston before being traded to the Timberwolves where he was waived before playing in a single game. After that, Jawan bounced around the league for a while, signing contracts with the Mavericks, Nuggets, Bobcats, and Trailblazers before finding a home with the Miami Heat, a team that at one point signed him to a $100 million contract. His career had come full circle. He went from being one of the best young players in the league 
to experiencing hardships with injuries and personal life issues that showed decline in his play on the court. To becoming an NBA journeyman who is now just a role player who could bring veteran leadership to a locker room. And while he wasn't the player he once was, he was still a valuable piece because of other aspects he brought to the game. He ended up winning two NBA championships with the Heat during his three years with the organization and retired after his last year with the Heat in 2013 with career averages of 13 points, six rebounds, and two assists per game. After retiring in 2013, Jawan remained with the Heat's organization as an assistant coach. He stayed in that role until 2019 when he was named head coach of Michigan's basketball team, a role he still holds to this day. And one of his sons, Jace, who was a top basketball recruit, actually committed to the school, which probably makes him pretty proud. Juwan's also still giving back to his community with charitable donations through Juwan Howard's Foundation, which partnered with Chicago Public Schools, Jordan Brand, Dell Computers, EMI Music, Vitamin Water, and the NBA to provide a free basketball camp that is hosted yearly. Juwan Howard wasn't given the best set of circumstances in life. He was born to a mother and father who weren't really ready for the responsibilities of being parents. He was raised in the projects on the south side of Chicago in a neighborhood riddled with gang violence and drugs and where every day is a blessing just to be alive. He lost the person who raised him and loved him more than anyone in the world right before finishing high school, yet he stayed fairly well-rounded. Even though he made plenty of mistakes along the way that I'm pretty sure he regretted. But he did his best with the hand he was dealt with and got the most out of his life and has accomplished enough that he can be proud of. And what I take from his story is while you can't always control the situation you're put in, you control how you deal with said situation. Well, that's it for this video. Until the next one, peace.